took six weeks into the MLS season, but Inter Miami has a win at last. Saved by the bell, too. Or the campana. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Miami Total Football Radio, a.k.a. Miami Total Football Radio, the number one and most listened to podcast on Inter Miami, touching on all the latest news and analysis that you could ask for with regards to the team. It's a podcast that's been listened to in 50 countries and counting. It's probably been more than 50 countries, to be honest with you. But uh, yeah, the, the stats, the analytics only give us the 50 right now. So that's where we're at. But anyway, my name is Franco Panizo. I am one third of your hosting team. And joining me are the two other thirds at long, long last. El Primo is back in the house. We will start with you. We will start with you, Steve. Not only because you've been gone for a few weeks, but because it was also your birthday earlier in the week. Happy belated, my friend. How are you doing and how did you celebrate? Yeah, thank you very much, mate. I celebrated by, no, I just went out with my wife, I think, in the evening. Pretty, pretty low key. Um, but yeah, no, nice to be back. Was in Barbados watching some cricket. And then me and Jose were on the front line of the tennis beat at the Miami Open for, for two weeks, which was uh, which was cool. Uh, it was a good event. And um, yeah, you know, it was, uh, it was a proper international event. So that was that was cool, and then, but yeah, but then back into it on uh, on on Saturday to uh, to see to see that win, and then we've been down at the press conference this week, uh, getting stuck into a few things, and there seems to be uh, plenty happening. It's never a dull moment, I don't think. <laughs> Can you deny the rumors that you have only returned because Inter Miami won? Because I'm sure there's some listeners out there that are like, "Where's you know?" They've been asking for you. They've been like, "Where's Primo?" We want to hear what he has to say. Last week, I jokingly said, jokingly said that you would not come back until Inter Miami won a game. And they've won a game, and now you're here. So I just, <laughs> I just think sometimes the players like look up to the press box. And when they don't see me, I just feel their, their morale just sort of goes down a bit. But I was, I was there, there on Saturday. I think I saw, I think that just gave them, you know, gave them a boost. You know? That lifted them to, to yeah. the victory. Yes. yes. Steve Brenner in the house, ladies and gentlemen. Jose Armando is also here. Cinco. How are you? Doing good. I'm doing good. I'm having trouble with my football manager career. Um, I'm, I'm going to start uh, um, by by apologizing because I remember a few weeks ago I said that I um, that I needed to finish my preseason in football manager before the last uh, podcast. I, is it, was it before the last pod? I yeah, think I it think was. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. we were supposed to do one. While I was in Peru, I had even taken my mic and everything, and obviously we didn't do one that week. Uh, so you were supposed to update them last week, which you did not. But now yes. that Steve's back, now that Steve's back, you, the football manager conversation football begins manager again. Back. See, people are going to, I swear people are going to think that Steve Brenner, no matter what we say, is associated with football manager. I swear. Uh, I swear. Uh, well, Jose witnessed my uh, my managerial failings in the when we had a bit of a downtime in the tennis. <laughs> yeah, it was very bad. It was very bad. Several mistakes. I mean, yeah, it was terrible. It was yeah, terrible. Geez, Probably say, but, yeah, but you, this preseason's taken like five seasons to complete. Right, so, yep, I mean, there yeah. it is. There it is. He called and, you out. <laughs> and I'm gonna have to restart. That's what I was trying to say because oh, yeah. I downloaded the game in uh, an old computer. That was a big, big mistake. And now I have to play on my laptop. And yesterday, I, I, yesterday I started um, a new season with Inter Miami because I couldn't start from where I left on the other computer. So, but now that I've I've gone through several preseason games and I know how the game is played, or at least that's what I think, um, I, I'm gonna get it done a lot faster. I think I might only play four or maybe six preseason games and, and and i'll be ready to go so only just get six on with it, get only on with six it. only six he says well yeah that's that's a good number well so, listen since we're plugging different things here even though i swear it to listeners we are not sponsored by any of this at least not yet hopefully steve can start you know making some moves over there but i did try the inter miami pub sub yesterday and i know i sent you guys a picture of it in our whatsapp group and it was it was decent i wouldn't say it's wow it's amazing but it was decent. It was decent. Like the what was that, like what the performance this weekend. What do Miami though? What, what, what? I don't. It's just a. It's just a, I don't know. They they made a deal with Publix and they named the sandwich <laughs> the Inter Miami Pub Sub. It has avocado and turkey and bacon and um, some special type of dressing. I don't know. I just wanted to try it, see what it's like. I jokingly told somebody 
Um, solid at first, but weak at the back, something like that. I, I made a joke about it, but no, it was it was decent. It's worth it's worth trying. I don't know if it'll be your favorite sandwich ever, but it's worth it's worth checking out at least once, at least in my opinion. But anyway, we're not here to talk about sandwiches or football manager, at least not in great we're not, detail. Really? <laughs> we're here to talk about Inter Miami because they finally won a game in the 2022 season off a historic hat trick from from Leonardo Campana. We are going to touch on the game. We are going to touch on Leonardo Campana's performance. What that means with regards to Gonzalo Higuain. We are going to have Nico Moreno on in the second segment to preview the game this weekend against the Seattle Sounders. And of course, at the very end, we will have our Q&A session with those of you that submitted some questions for us. So, plenty to get to. A lot to discuss. Jose... And Steve, let's get to it. Okay, folks, so Inter-Miami is victorious at last. They win 3-2 to two against the New England Revolution at Drive Pink Stadium in Fort Lauderdale on Saturday afternoon. Inter-Miami came out in the 4-3-3 that we expected or that Jose and I expected. I don't know what Steve expected, but that Jose and I expected and we talked about last week on the podcast. And this was the starting lineup. You had Nick Marsman in goal, DeAndre Yedlin. Damian Lowe, I'm in Mabika, making his first appearance of the MLS season, and Christopher McVeigh at left back. Those were, that was your back four, or those four players comprised your back four. The midfield three, once again, was Gene Mota, Gregory, and Robert Taylor. And then up top, Ariel Lasseter and Robbie Robinson flanking Leonardo Campana. Gonzalo Higuain, nowhere to be found on the game day roster. He was said by a team spokesperson to have had a slight knee injury. So we're going to touch on that in just a little bit. But we will start with the collective. I will ask you, Primo, since you are returning to the pod after a few weeks, what was your biggest takeaway or what was your biggest analysis point after this game? I just I, I just thought of just watching the play, you know, the players that have thought about the players that have left and the players that have replaced them. I think that they've done a good job in in just improving on what they've, you know, what what point do you think, I wish wish they had Leandro Gonzalez Perez there? You know, I thought Mabika was was good. I like Robert Taylor in, in that midfield role for, he was great, super busy, energetic. He's good on the ball. He, he pushed it forward. A motto I thought was great. He's not the player I thought he was. He's not really that playmaker, but he's such an upgrade on, I mean, you could say an upgrade on Pizarro, an upgrade on, on Matuidi. He's just lively, just good on the ball. Um, he was snapping into tackles. He was super aggressive. I think Lasseter is good. I think the one player that potentially that was, is a shame they left is Lewis Morgan because I think he could have he could have fitted in well to this team. But I liked, um, yeah, I thought I, I thought Lasseter was good. Robbie Robinson was was okay. You know, Phil Neville got agitated a couple of times when he was asked about Robbie Robinson because I think he's desperate for him to step up. He sees a player in there, and he's. I think one of the guys afterwards, bless him, was saying that he thought that you know Robbie Robinson played an amazing game. I didn't think he was that that. Good. He did okay. Uh, and I was pleased with Campagna. He took his goals really well. The third one was a little bit lucky. The first two were, were, were great. Um, I just I just thought the players that have come in, sort of, you know, Yedlin was good. I like McVeigh, even though he's not really a left back. Um, I just think that they've, those players look to me to be a, an upgrade on on the players that have gone out. And yeah, it's only one game. Yes, <laughs> was, they won. I was going to say, this is, this is a, this is a big... Uh... You're going out on a limb here. You're going out on a limb here. No, no, no. It's one game. But I'm just saying, I haven't seen him play for a couple of weeks in in, in the flesh. And I just, I like what I, I like, I like what I saw from. Him, but it's only, it's only one game. Um, we, we could be singing a completely different tune next next week. But I thought, it, I looked, I thought it was pretty promising, to be honest. If I'm going to uh, be super, super positive. That's that's fine. They won, and I forgot to mention. Well, the goal scorers. I said Campana got a hat trick for New England. An early goal from Justin Rennicks in the 11th minute. Carles Hill tied the game up off of a penalty kick, which we'll touch on later on in the show, whether it was or wasn't. He tied it up in the second half, but Campana came up with the winner in the 88th minute. Jose, what was your biggest takeaway or your biggest analysis point? Your biggest one, because I asked Steve for the biggest one and he gave me like seven, but <laughs> Jose, what was what was yours? Yeah, my biggest takeaway, um, you know, it goes back to the fact that they were able to respond after conceding a goal early. Um, that's something that they have struggled with before. Um, not not early, not even early goals, 
not not only early goals, but you know, whenever they can see the goal, they usually crumble and and they it, it's a whole mess and 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 they go away from the game mentally. But I think you know on Saturday they they were a different team when they when they conceded a goal, they had some more confidence. They showed it a little bit. Um, they were able to score in the second half. You know, a penalty that you know I think that's a 50-50 call. Um, to me, it's not a penalty, but you know, I, I get it why why the referee called it. Um, Jose, so, just, you know, Jose just jumped ahead like eight yes. topics. <laughs> so, two, so it's two two, and, and they they overcome that as well. So that's my biggest takeaway. You know, I, I really like the fact that you know they were able to mentally stay in the game, and, and then they were they were able to create chances and, and score on them. And and you know to touch on another point, even though you don't want this, Franco, um, <laughs> uh, just the beauty of having a number nine, right? A player that is right there inside the box, taking care of chances, putting them in the back of the net. So that's my my takeaway. I think that's that that's going to be a talking point throughout the pot. So I'm not gonna elaborate on that as much as as we're going to later on. Well, I will because that is to me the biggest talking point. I'm surprised both of you left that for for almost last in your in your various thoughts there. Inter Miami had a number nine, a more pure number nine in this game, and obviously he he gets the hat trick, and obviously he's gotten the plaudits. MLS Team of the Week, MLS Player of the Week, first Inter Miami player to do that this season uh, uh, from the Player of the Week side, first hat trick in franchise history, but. The team just functioned better as a result of that. Not just because of the goals, but because of his ability to press, fight for 50-50s, and his ability to have that presence in the box consistently. That reference point that Inter Miami's attack has been missing, they had that in this game, and obviously you see the the, the dividends that are paid uh, or, or the results of that because the first two goals are set up from... Both wingers, that's not a coincidence. Robbie Robinson and Ariel Lasseter, or excuse me, Ariel Lasseter first, then Robbie Robinson second. They set up the ball, uh, the goals with with balls in two Campana. So Inter Miami has been needing a number nine. We've talked at length, even dating back to last season, about Iguain's propensity and habit of dropping deeper and, and looking to pick up the ball as opposed to being in the box. We've, t- we've touched on the reasons why. You know, he, he might do that and why, and sometimes it's made sense, other times it has not. But in this game, they had a more pure striker in the box, and it worked out greatly for Phil Neville, for Inter Miami. And of course, we're going to start there. We're going to start there, because I want to hear a little bit more from you guys as to Campana's performance and what you thought he brought. Because the goals are what we will focus on, and the presence in the box as well. But I also saw a player that, when I rewatched the game in the 89th minute, was pressing and fighting for 50-50 balls down the sidelines to help try to grind out the victory. And that's the type of energy and effort that Iguain cannot provide at this point in his career. Now, I know he gets criticized a lot for that, understandably so. I think at this point in his career, his body just, he just doesn't have it. His body just can't do it. He physically can't do it. I don't know if it's a if it's a lack of desire, maybe there's some element of that for Higuain, but I also think that he just he just can't do it. His body just doesn't won't give him won't give him that type of uh, that type of output. If he tries to press like that or tries to play like that, he he probably would last 20, 30 minutes tops. I I, I mean that's just my my uh, my opinion from the outside. But anyway, primo, Campana's performance overall, goals included, presence in the in the eighteen. What did you think? I thought he, I thought he was good. He's a big guy, isn't he? You know, we spoke to him post match. He's a big unit for for 21 years old. I think Phil Neville said he looks like a like a man. You know, he's he's a he's a big guy. Puts himself about. I don't think he's he hasn't necessarily he's not blessed with pace, but um, he's big big and strong. He's decent on the ball. Holds it up nicely. Took his took his goals well. Um, yeah, I I was I was impressed with him. And, you know, obviously he's he's wants to he he wants to go to the World Cup. I think that's key. You know, he he's going to be fully focused on that not that he's not going to be focused on into Miami but he's got a real really massive career potentially career life-changing uh goal that he can focus on that which is playing in the world cup against for Ecuador 
Uh, but I think that can only benefit into Miami. So yeah, I, I liked uh, I liked I liked what I saw from him, and he took his took his took his goals well. The first one in uh, the first two in particular were great. The second one was was a great strike, and it was a perfect hat trick. I forgot to mention that. And I think it's kind of been overlooked in the overall coverage of the game, just in general, including from the myself. The third goal was a bit rubbish, wasn't it? But, it wasn't, but it counts as a perfect hat trick in the in the sense of a uh, headed finish, a left footed finish, and then a right footed finish. So he scored in yeah. with all three different. Uh, in all three different types of ways, or in three different types of ways, which is obviously a, a testament to to him. Even though the third goal, like you said, it was a bit fortuitous. It was a bit fortunate for him and for Inter Miami, but they got the win. Jose, what did you think about Campana's performance overall? Obviously the goals, but just what he brought to the team. Well, you know, I think it comes down to motivation, right? I think, you know, there's... Uh... Uh, for for Campana, this is a, this is a big opportunity. Um, he has been waiting for a moment in which you know he can a team can rely on him, and and he's going to have uh, opportunities. And I think Inter Miami provided that for him over the weekend. And you know I, I'm sure he has been working hard during training because that showed during the game. And um, you know if you want to compare him with with Gonzalo Guain, I just think you know at this time there are two different players. Um, Gonzalo, basically the motivation for Gonzalo is to take this team to the playoffs and maybe have a chance of winning the the MLS Cup, which, as we all know, is a long shot right now. It's a very, very long shot. So the motivation for Gonzalo Higuain is basically, you know, to try to keep on playing and see what happens this year. It's completely different for, for Leo Campana because he's 21 years old. He's getting started. Um, I'm sure he, he wants to go back to the Premier League at some point. He wants to play the World Cup this year. I mean, you know, the, the, the motivation is completely different. And obviously, you know, this year, as we all know, uh, Campana is not a starter for Inter Miami. So he wants to be a starter at some point in this team as well. So he's fighting for that spot. So I think it comes down to motivation. And, you know, it's a good game. It's a good, it's a great game. We can say that. But, you know, the team is going to need a lot more from him if, if he wants to be a starter for this team. So good start, but we'll see what happens this week. I like that. Obviously, like I said, the presence in the 18, but this is clearly, based off how it's been built and what we've seen through six games, a team that's made for counterattacking soccer, a team that's made for transition moments. And with Higuain, who's obviously not blessed with a whole lot of pace at this point in his career, and, and I don't think he ever really was, but they don't get that because he's, he's not in the box enough. And in this game, with the speed of Robinson, the speed of Lasseter, having that presence in the 18 it proved vital for Inter Miami because now they had someone they could find when they attacked quickly and they had someone in the box to find in dangerous spots. And the first goal, it's not like he made a incredible, incredible movements in the penalty area to, to get open. I mean, the defense from new England was a bit, a bit lax there, but he was there. He was there to put the ball away and he does so clinically with his head. The second one is, is a fantastic left footed finish at the back post Made no mistake with that one. Uh, when we were in the press box, actually, I said out loud as that play was was, was starting because because Inter Miami hits back uh, on a quick counter that that needed to be finished. That needed to be a goal, just in general, because Inter Miami on that sequence had a numerical advantage. They had four attackers against two defenders. Gregory took a little bit of time uh, or took a little too long on the ball, so it became a four v three at some point. But then Inter Miami still was able to put the ball into the back of the net with Robbie Robinson hitting a low cross into uh, or, or towards the back post for Campana. Again, for that great, great left-footed finish. What does this mean for Gonzalo Higuain, guys? What does this mean with regards to his starting role with the group? Once he's healthy, and I know that there's been some questions as to whether he's actually injured at all, but once he's back in the 18, I'll start with you, Jose. Is he is he a bench player going forward? What what do, what do they do with Gonzalo Higuain at this point? No, I'm sorry, but I just don't think he's a bench player. I don't think he's a bench player in this team. Wow. Um, okay. I, I don't think I don't think that's the case. Um, listen, if Gonzalo Higuain goes to the bench, and I know Phil said yesterday that he's going to be involved in some way over the weekend, but. Listen, I still think Gonzalo Wayne is is a better option than Campana if he plays as a nine. So I think right now, Phil, he, he has enough 
to show Gonzalo, this is the way we're going. This worked over the weekend. And we believe that if you're in the position Campana was against the England Revolution, you're going to score as many goals as we need. Um, and if and if Gonzalo agrees to that, then he needs to start because he's a better no player. Way. He's a better finisher. I don't see that. He's a better finisher than Campana is. So if that is the case, he needs to start. If Gonzalo goes back to, I'm going to do things my way. I want to be the 10. I want to do this. I want to do that. This is my team. This is what I want to do. Then, you know, obviously there's trouble, and then you have to go with Campana. But if Gonzalo agrees to be a nine and to follow what Phil wants to do, which, listen, right now they won that game because those players, the 11 players and the subs that came in, they all bought into Phil's idea. At least that's what I see, right? They, they bought into Phil's idea to play a 4-3-3, to have a true nine, to play through the wing, and that worked. That worked for them. So why would why would I want to change that? I think right now we have seen that, you know, with Gonzalo Wayne as a 10, things are not working for Inter Miami. Completely different over the weekend. So I think that's the way to go. Obviously, a completely different game uh, against against Seattle, playing on the road, and you're probably going to be more defensive-minded, you know, better team. Um, New England Revolution, they were struggling. They are struggling. So, right, is New, New England is game. in last. New England, well, sorry, Inter Miami remains in last place in the Eastern Conference with the win. New England drops to thirteenth. They're even on points, but uh, New England has a better goal differential at minus four compared to Inter Miami's negative nine. But anyway, I disagree with you that Iguain goes back into the starting lineup once he's ready to be integrated again. I think Campana's a starter at, at this point in time. Now. I don't think Campana will be the every game starter from here to the rest of the the rest of the season, but I do think that Campana has has, has clearly shown that he's ahead of Iguain right now. And you said he's a better player. So you think you think Gonzalo Iguain is not gonna is, is gonna be happy about you know being in the bench and I mean he and didn't look he up. didn't look too happy. Yes, up, he didn't that, look that, too that happy up point. up in the in the when the by the way I don't know who made that call. Uh, in the on the TV programming side, and I, I need to say this, I don't know who made that call to show Gonzalo Higuain's reaction after the second goal, but kudos to whoever it was because that is knowing your material, and that made for great TV and obviously a big talking point for people that watch the game, for Inter Miami fans, for media that covers Inter Miami. It's it's knowing your material and a great 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 decision, even if maybe the team didn't like it all that much, but. Um, good stuff from whoever That's made it. That's the way to do it. Whoever made, yeah, Even no, if of course. Like it. That's the of way to course. go. Whoever so, made yeah. that call, fantastic, fantastic, fantastic stuff. Kudos, kudos to you. I tip, I tip my cap. I want to find out who did it so that I can, I can more publicly give them, give them their kudos. But uh, anyway, I think Gonzalo Higuain is going to be a a role player. I think he he will have a part. But I think Campana, with what he showed, not not just because of the goals. Because you can take the goals out of it. It's just what he brought to the team and how the team looked better. Yes, against an opponent that, like we said, is not uh, the greatest right now. But Inter Miami just functioned better as a team. It played better. It looked better. It had an, a more established and clear identity. And on top of that, Campana, like you mentioned, is younger, hungrier, more energetic, and can give you more effort than Higuain can at this point in his career. So Gonzalo Higuain is no Blaise Matuidi. No, right listen, now. Gonzalo Let's Higuain is Gonzalo Higuain has technical abilities, and we've seen how he can hit a pass. We know that he can finish when he when he's in and around the box, but he's not there often enough, and the team doesn't play that well. We're gonna touch on that in a second as well, because that's another talking point. Maybe Steve has something Steve wants to bring up as well. Other players looked freer without him on the field. Now, maybe there's a lot of things that go into that: the level of the opponent, playing at home coming back into the game and taking the first lead of the season, going into halftime. It's, you know, there's, there's a bunch of different things that go into it. But I saw I saw players that played freer. He would rather retire before being a bench player no for this No way, Miami. no way, dude, no way. He's he's collecting that $6 million, $7 million check regardless of... Money's not on the a bench. problem. Oh, Let me listen, remind you listen, that. listen, money, you can, have, you can have a good bit of money, but if it's the last year of your career... You're, and you're you're not going to get that money anywhere else. You're taking that paycheck, Steve. 
You've been quiet. You've been quiet. Go to the bench and just be happy about I don't, it. Like, I, I didn't say he'll be happy. I didn't say he'll be happy. But I think well, that's. I think that's the rule. I think that's the rule that's going to happen. I think that's where Phil Neville is going to have to manage uh, the situation. But Primo, I haven't heard from you in a, in a couple minutes here. What are your thoughts on the overall situation with Gonzalo Higuain? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, Campania is the future, isn't he? Higuain's not not the future. If they could get rid of him now, they they you know they would do. I think uh, there's, there's probably no way he's going to drop him for for the weekend. You know, drop who? Drop right, who? Wait, wait, hold on, hold on. No, sorry. I mean, Campania. There's no way Campania's not going to play. I would, you know, you can't you can't do that. I mean, he, he's you know he, he was great. He was great on Saturday. Um, obviously, different opposition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but yeah, I think they, they did look freer. And, you know, Higuain is a very dominant kind of presence. He, he's got that story career behind him. Um, you know, maybe they did feel like, you know, what, there's more pressure when, he, when he's, in the, when he's in, in the team. He's the main guy and all that kind of thing. And maybe this, is, this was a younger, newer look, you know, uh, team. So I, I can't, I, I, it's, he's going to have to just to suck it up. I mean, that's, if he's not in the team, he's not in the team. Yeah, he could. I, 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 you know, could he play in central midfield? Yeah, probably. Um, but at the expense of, you know, Motta or Robert Taylor. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I don't see I that. Yeah, I don't see that. I don't see I that. I don't see that happening. Phil, 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 Phil Neville clearly likes that midfield three. He clearly like likes that midfield three. Well, exactly. Three, you know. Exactly. Remember, Motta, Motta also hit the bar, didn't he, with a free kick just uh, early just, on? Just yes, very early, early. on. Yeah. No, he's going to have to suck it up. He's a big boy. He's he's playing at some of the biggest clubs in the world. He's played the World Cup. He's going to have to suck it up and try and get back in the team. If he doesn't want to get back in the team or he's not up for it, then then you know he'll, his career will just dwindle away at the end of it, and and they'll 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 say their, their goodbyes, and that'll be it. I, you know, I think it's pretty it's pretty simple. He's you know clearly there's an issue there, and 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 as we were told at the back end of last season with you know that Pizarro and, and Iguain couldn't really play together. There's maybe he's not as adaptable. This in this stage of his career than, than he potentially was earlier on. I don't know, but um, he's he's just going to have to deal with it. Jose, I will let you rebuttal if you if you have anything you want to add. No, listen, I agree that Campana deserves a spot in the starting lineup. What I'm saying is that, you know, I think Gonzalo Wayne will be there too. <laughs> no, I, I'm just, I don't see that. Don't no see way, that. I don't think so. How did he get him into that team? I thought I think Lasseter was was good. It doesn't work with him, and well, he plays a role right on the right hand side of a three. It just doesn't. We have doesn't seen them work. play together before, and it didn't work. They got they got they 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 tied one game zero zero. They didn't score in that game. Although to be fair, Gonzalo Iguain did did uh, hit him with a couple of passes that he should have put away against the fire. And then they played together against LAFC, and that that didn't work. So I just don't I'm see it. Similar. I just it's don't see similar. it. I don't see it. I just don't like it. it you you lose defensive work rate collective like as a collective, and you lose speed. As a collective, and like I said before, this is a team that's built for transition moments. This is a team that's built for counterattacking soccer. And how do you counterattack? Well, you need to be precise with the ball, and you need to be quick with the ball. And Inter Miami Listen, with Higuain on the was, field is not that not that fast. If it was so. up to me, I would rather have Rodolfo Pizarro on this team right now than Gonzalo Higuain. But you know, it is what it is. You know, Gonzalo Higuain is still part of this team, and and we all know his personality. So. You know, do you want to have him on an island again in the in the locker room and just, you know? I mean, it's for, um, if it's for the better of the team, maybe, maybe. No, but you don't want that inside a locker room. I mean, you want to you want to be everybody to be together. I mean, and, but and are, are they to, to, are they together about. when he's on the field though? That I mean, we've talked about his impact in terms of the chemistry on the field and in the locker room. Like, you know, he's well, obviously a big have, presence. No. He's a big presence, big personality. You know, does does he does he make other players play? Not as free, like I saw. I saw stuff from Robbie Robinson this this in this game that we've rarely, if ever, seen from Robbie Robinson, including that that moment in the second half where he got into it with with uh, with Kessler uh, for a ball that went out for uh, for a throw in near the sidelines where they got into a, sho- a shoving contest there. Like it just saw a more aggressive Robbie Robinson, generally speaking, not just on that play, but in terms of uh, with the ball and his decision making as well. So. Is his is Gonzalo Higuain if he's separated from the group or if he's he's isolated and and not playing is that going to really be a detriment to the team more so than it is when he's playing I I don't know I mean we haven't seen a great team through the first five games in the sixth in the sixth game of the season we saw a better team and obviously the the end product is a win even if they had tied right if even if they had drawn if they don't get that last goal off that that fortuitous bounce. I still think our sensation is largely the same in that they 
played much better without him. Yeah, but you're acting like, I mean, like Inter Miami doesn't need Higuain anymore. You know, Campana, he was great, but he's not going to play at the same level every single game. And, you know, you might need Gonzalo Higuain late in the game, and he's not going to want to come in with the same, if he's on an island, if, if he's, you know, relegated to being a role player, he's not going to take that very well. Why I mean, not? But why like, not? But then, but then, but then that's, you know, that's his problem. Leave. He what, believes he he's a out? high caliber player. He <laughs> believes he's a high caliber player, and he deserves to start. You know, that's that's what every football player will tell you. Um, they all want to start. They all want to play. And Gonzalo Wayne, his mentality is that I was a world world class player. Maybe he believes he's still a world class player. I don't know, but he doesn't. You know, in the, especially in this team, he's not going to be okay with being a role player. So, you know, whenever you need him, he's not going to be ready for you. You know, the, it is what it is. I know it's wrong. I know it's wrong. And it shouldn't be that way. But, you know, that's what we have seen from him so far. That's why we praised Blaise Matuidi last year when he was benched. And whenever he came in the game, he was good. He was, a, a, at least he brought some energy. Not good, but he brought some energy. And, and he showed some desire to, to go back into the starting lineup. But I don't think that's the case with Gonzalo. I don't think that's the case at all. This is a, a, a side note, parentheses here, parentheses. But I, I mean, I think in remind me, and maybe hindsight's twenty twenty. But I, I remember saying this maybe at the beginning of the season to to somebody. I don't know if I did it on the podcast, but in remind me could have tried to buy him out, Gonzalo Higuain, and kept Matuidi. If, if you're gonna, you can only buy one out, right? Per MLS rules, and if they if they they could have bought Gonzalo Higuain out, obviously that would cost them more money because Higuain makes almost double, or or more than double of what Matuidi made last year. But if they could have bought out one DP, they could have bought out Gonzalo Higuain and just had Matuidi as a role player on the bench because he's a more positive impact in the locker room, at least from what we know, than what it seems Gonzalo Higuain is. But anyway, that will be Phil Neville's challenge: is how to how to manage the situation. So going forward, how will Phil Neville manage Gonzalo Higuain in terms of his role, in terms of the the impact on the field and off of it? We'll see how he goes about it. That will be very key, obviously, to how a, how a lot of this season plays out or how a lot of the rest of the season plays out. Now, speaking of Phil Neville, and we're, we're going long, so let's try, to, let's try to shorten up here, but have to give him his due credit because he made substitutions in this game that helped Inter Miami win it late. Now, I'm going to before we get into that, I'm going to give you another analysis point from my personal stance. I liked Inter Miami's first half, and I did not like their second half. They won the game in the second half. They scored late. I give them credit for being in a position to win the game, something they had not been in for much of the season, in a position to win a game off of a lucky bounce or a or a bad call, or a mistake at the back. They had, they were in a position to do that, and they deserve credit for that, but I did not like their second half, by and large. They did not play well in the second half. I thought they were too defensive-minded, too focused on trying to protect the lead, and, and that just allowed New England to, to have the ball for large shares, and they obviously get the equalizer off of a penalty kick, which, again, we will talk, we will touch on in a little bit. Uh, and, and then the game from there... Uh, was pretty was pretty even was pretty locked. There was no there was no real big saves from Nick Marsman or or New England's goalkeeper. So I didn't like the second half. The game winning goal comes off of a good penetrating dribbling run from Bryce Duke, who I believe was making his Inter Miami debut. I believe, if I'm not mistaken. But Bobby Shuttleworth uh, spills the ball. No, not Bobby Shuttleworth. Shuttleworth. Brad Knighton. Excuse me, Brad Knighton. Brad Knighton spills the ball, and that's when Campana was able to just push it, push it home from close range. So, I didn't like the second half, but Phil Neville gets credit for bringing in Bryce Duke instead of Mo Adams. Bryce Duke's a more attack-minded player, and obviously he he was very key in that in that game-winning play. He also brought in Noah Allen to help shore up the defense and, and give him a little bit more solidity. So Phil Neville gets his credit for the substitutions. Although again, I did not like the the game plan of the second half. I'll start with Jose. Your thoughts on his substitutions and the second half performance? Well, yeah, I think you know. I, I, I mean, we're gonna say they work because because they end up winning the game. Um, but yeah, I think they were they were good. 
Uh, I think there were some good decisions there. And I think when it comes down to the second half, yeah, it was a little bit disappointing that they couldn't keep up the intensity of the first half. And, you know, if the game ends up with a 2-2 draw, then we're going to go back to that first half and, uh, first half, and we're going to be asking why weren't they able to keep it up. But listen, this is this is not a good team, you know. So um, any, any way they can find to win games, um, I, I think, I think if they if they needed to um, to go to that that uh, that defensive setup in the second half, you know, it, it's because there was some pressure as well. You know, there was some pressure to get that win, to get the result. Um, that's why I give them credit. And that, I felt like they were I, too defensive, though. I felt they became too yeah, defensive yeah. once they got once they took the two to one lead. Even late in the first half, they became too defensive minded. Like I, I get wanting to protect the lead, but they like it looked like they dropped their lines, and it looked like they were so hell bent on trying to get the win by being defensively solid and not not being exposed at the back that they became too much, uh, or they gave up the ball too much, and they allowed New England to to attack them more than they had when they were playing, you know, on a more toe to toe basis. And then that I think that's a that's where the second goal comes from because New England had the ball for for long spells. And then they they find the opening on one play, and then there's a penalty get call that some people think is a penalty, some people do not. But again, we will we'll debate that in just a bit. So I think they could have been, you know, they could have focused a little bit more on the defensive side without being so defensive minded. I thought they dropped their lines too deep, and I thought they 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 just got away from what they were doing well. But that's just my opinion. Or do you think this team is ready to play full 90 minutes the way they started the game? Again, like they don't have to play ball. exactly the same. Uh, they, they don't have to play exactly the same. The they cannot play at the level. So, you know, as much as we wish for that, the reality is that at least right now, they cannot play at a high level consistently. So they have to, you know, they have to stay well organized. And, and, and again, there was a lot of pressure on that game. They needed to win that game. No, hey, listen, again, and, and we're going to Steve here after this, but... Credit for finding a way to win the game and being in a position to win the game because that's progress from what this team has been for much of this season. That's progress. But I didn't like the game plan. I did like the substitutions. Duke and Allen, I thought, were, were good introductions. He could have easily gone with Mo Adams, who's not as attack-minded as Bryce Duke, and maybe they don't get that, that winning goal. Uh, and So I thought that, that that was key. So Phil Neville deserves his, his credit as well for pushing the right buttons in this game late on. Despite, in my opinion, not having the best game plan in that second half. Primo, your thoughts? Well, you know, remember, this is a team that haven't won this season up until that game. There, I think, a bit of nervousness going in there. Thought New England probably played better second second half. Um, yeah, they were sitting back, probably tired as well. You know, some, some, you know a number of different things. They shouldn't be they tired. Can... They shouldn't be tired. They're a South yeah, Florida they... team playing at home in the afternoon. They're tired, but... You know they were pressing hard in the first half. I think you know sometimes it just you sit back and then they then they scored. They got the equaliser. But yeah, Duke Bryce Duke came on and just gave them a little bit of energy, didn't he? Set up set up the goal. Um, so yeah, I mean you just I th- there's a lack of there's been a lack of confidence in the team, isn't there? You know even when they went one nil down, you're like oh god here we go, and then they sort of kind of turned it around. So that you know cliche winning breeds confidence, but it's it's, it's true. You know they'll, oh, they'll, they'll they'll learn from that. So uh, yeah. As Sven Goran Eriksson said, first half good, second half maybe not so good, but they got the win, which is the main thing. They did get the win, and we heard the the festive celebrations. We could hear it from the press conference room, which is very close to the locker room. We heard the music blaring. We heard the the shouts of joys and the vamos and all that. So clearly, clearly uh, a very happy and very uh, uplifted locker room. I just would, again, reiterate that in the second half, I think they invited too much pressure by being so defensive, which, again, I understand it. I understand the thought behind it. I just didn't agree with with being so, so defensive-minded. But anyway, let's quickly touch on anything else you guys would like to talk about with regards to the game before we... Actually, let's just do it. Let's just do it now. Let's just do it now. Penalty or no penalty? I'll go back to you, Primo. Was that a penalty kick on Damian Lowe in the second half? I've I've, I've, I've been watching it again this morning. Absolutely not a penalty. He, he doesn't touch him. He doesn't touch him. It's the no. first time I've actually seen, <laughs> seen, seen the replay. He doesn't touch him. He goes across him. And uh, there's minimal contact. I mean, he, he goes into him. Wow. It was very, very poor decision. Okay. I mean, it, it was. Okay. It was. I'm sorry. And, I, and I, I, I said it when it was live. I'm watching it again right this second. I mean, he, he goes for the ball. Okay. He doesn't even he doesn't even hit hit the guy. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of listeners that will agree with you. Because, again, this play was it seemed very... Uh... 
divided. Jose, I think you already said earlier on, again, you beat us to the punch there, but you do not think it was a penalty kick either. Correct? No, I think that's a that's a 50-50 call. I would go with no, not a penalty. I've seen Damian Lowe make that that play several times. Several times. You know, that's just his style. And um, But that doesn't mean it's not a penalty not... kick just because it's his style. That's not a good argument for why it's... I don't think it's, I'm free... trying I don't to think say... it's a free kick. I don't think it's a free kick if that was in the middle of the of the pitch. I don't think that's a free kick. So, okay. So I guess I guess I will be the negative Nancy. Yeah, he goes for the ball, but it's I mean, a penalty kick. It's a penalty kick. Absolutely, it's a penalty kick. Absolutely, it's a penalty kick. He he tries to get in front of of the, of the dribbler. He tries to get in front of him and completely impedes his forward progress. And he doesn't. And he doesn't even really get the ball. He just. He's not looking to play the ball. He's looking to play the man. And he gets in front of him. He puts his left. Uh, Steve, you have the the replay. I don't have the replay in front of me, but Steve, I think you do. He's, yeah. He sticks his left leg in front of the dribbler, impedes his ability to progress forward. It's a clear cut penalty. It's a clear. He's I thought for the ball. He's uh, for the ball. You can go he's for you. For you ball. can go for the ball you want, but if you don't get the ball and you get the man, that's a penalty. If it was shoulder to shoulder, if it was shoulder to shoulder. If it was, he absolutely touches him. Look at the replay. His left leg impedes impedes the run, the ability to run forward. The left leg. If it was shoulder to shoulder, if it was a shoulder to shoulder challenge, that's clean. That's allowed. If if the player falls over, the attacking player falls over. Watching it again right now. I'm watching it again. Watch that left leg. Watch Damian Lowe's left leg. He doesn't touch him. He doesn't. He just gets ahead of him. He gets ahead of him. He doesn't touch him, man. He doesn't touch him. Even when he falls over, he doesn't touch him. If he got ahead of him, his whole body would be ahead of him. He sticks his left leg out to try to get ahead of him. Doesn't. But he doesn't go down off on the basis of being hit by Damian Lowe. He just goes down. He's not. T- he doesn't bend. So you. So you think you yeah. think Damian Lowe's left leg just 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 doesn't interrupt his momentum. He just fell over without touching Damian Lowe's left leg. Franco, you're not winning this battle. Hey, that's fine. I, listen, I'm not here to convince what? you guys. That's I'm not, not here to convince you guys. That's a, for me. That's a penalty kick. I said it when I saw it live in the stadium. I thought it was a penalty kick based on just the movements he from my over. seat. He falls over after his left leg hits the ground, and then he Damien Lowe's, Damien Lowe's leg like comes back, and then he falls over. But he's already falling over. It's, it's not a penalty. I'm sorry, it's not a penalty. We won't talk about it anymore. <laughs> you can file this with that Pizarro. It, I shouldn't. He shouldn't play in Austria. Conversation that we had, uh, where you think you're right and you're clearly wrong. So there you go. Well, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm clearly wrong. I think this is. Uh, I think I think you guys. Just disagree with my opinion. That's all I'll say. That's all I'll say. I definitely think it's a penalty kick. I, if it was the other way around on the other side of the field, Inter Miami would be asking for a penalty kick. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, anything else you guys want to touch on with regards to this game? I thought Christopher McVeigh at left back was an interesting decision. It worked out for the most part, although that first goal between he and Robbie Robinson, uh, they, could, they should have done better. On the eleventh minute play that that ended in the Justin Rennick goal, but uh, anything else you guys want to touch on with regards uh, to this game? Uh, one thing, one thing, because I, I've criticized a lot Robbie Robinson in the start of the season. Well, the, the game, the, the games that he played, I criticize him a lot. So I see improvement. I see improvement in the last game. I think he was a lot more effective, not running so much with the ball and just running into the wall consistently. This time, you know, uh, uh, quicker decisions, passing the ball a lot faster and not when he's out of options. So I'm going to give him some credit. He's getting better, better, better performance. So hopefully he's able to keep this up and that they'll be good for Inter Miami. Steve, anything you want to add? Yeah, I thought Robbie Robinson did, did okay in the first half, but I just thought I liked, I liked Motta and uh, Robert Taylor in the, in, in the middle, definitely. Um, you know, Motta just sort of buzzing around and then Robert Taylor just had – in him to sort of pick up the ball and go and go forward because I mean, ostensibly he's like a winger, isn't he? Really, but playing more centrally, I think he looks like a good, a good player. You know, and he's also got a lot of skill. If you didn't even saw his Instagram, but he was doing some crazy tricks in the car park um, the other week, the other day. So um, yeah, I like him. Well, that well that midfield three is start. It, it's been playing more of like a, an inverted triangle where Gregory sits a little bit deeper, or Gregory, excuse me, sits a bit deeper, and then Taylor and Mota play a little bit. Further in front of him, I don't know if you want to call it five yards. I don't know the exact distance, but they play a little bit further ahead of him, and obviously they're tasked with more attacking responsibilities in terms of moving the ball forward, penetrating themselves. Gene Mota continues to take shots from distance. 
which which I like, which I like. Uh, I think one of those is going to pay off, and I think you need that in team. You need someone that isn't afraid to have a go from distance, so obviously as long as they're not overdoing it. So, uh, you know, I, that midfield three looked better in this game. Maybe that's that's obviously down to maybe improved chemistry from more games together, but also, of course, take into consideration the level of the opponent. We will wrap up the first segment, but Steve, I'm looking at the replay now. Now I'm looking at the replay of the penalty kick. I'm going back to it. It's it's a penalty kick for me, clear cut. I, I see what you're saying with regards to Renix. The ball starts getting away from him, and he tries to stretch out his right leg to try to, to, try to reach it. But Damian Lowe comes and cleans him out, man. But cleans he him out. Man. Cleans him he out. Dude, cleans him he out. Goes cleans down. him out. He goes down after after. So he just he just fell. He just fell. That's what you're saying. Like you're not you're not even taking into contact that his that Damian Lowe comes in and and makes contact with him. Clear contact. There's there's literally body on body contact there. I don't like. So like even if you said it's not a penalty kick, for you to say he just falls down by himself, I don't oh, agree right. with that at all because he definitely like there's definitely body contact there. A hundred percent. I I think he goes down with without any contact. I really do. I really do. I'm, right. I'm watch, I've watched right. it about 10 to 12 times right. in the last minute. All right. All right. Well, yeah. we will wrap up the first segment with some updates from this week's practice uh, or from what we could see on Tuesday. Victor Uyoa, Kieran Gibbs, and Ryan Saylor were all back in, in training, at least from the part that we could see, the first 15, 20 minutes that we could see on, on Tuesday. Edison Ascona and Georgia Costa were not as, uh, excuse me, Acosta has had surgery to take out to debris in his right knee, I believe, meniscus, and he's out for six to eight weeks. I'm trying to rattle my brain there for, for the memory, six to eight weeks. And that's going to pick up an injury over the weekend and is is not as long-term. I, I believe he's more of a day-to-day situation, as is Iguain, but he is expected to play some role on Saturday, though we'll find out more information during Thursday's practice session. But that does it for this first segment. We'll leave it there. We will come back and preview this weekend's game in Seattle against the Sounders with Nico Moreno. But we're going to take a quick break. So let's do that first. And then we'll come back and talk about Saturday's matchup. And what, and what you saw today was, was, was a little bit more complete, uh, but, but nowhere near 100%. So, so uh, but I, I, hope, I hope everybody went away today thinking... DME, that, that was more of a reflection of what we wanted to see as an Inter Miami team. Okay, guys, it's that time of week yet again where we preview the upcoming game. And this time it will be Inter Miami traveling all the way to the other side of the country. And they will take on the Seattle Sounders on Saturday night. That game will be played at 10 p.m. Eastern time. So it's a late one for you folks. Be ready to stay up if you plan to watch it. Joining us to preview the game is an MLS reporter. He goes by the name of Nico Moreno. He writes for Sounder at Heart and Pulso Sports. He's a friend of a few years now. So, you know, I, I can give you stick too for a Peru's win over Colombia back in January, but I won't, except for the mention. Anyway, Nico, how are you doing, brother? Hey, Franco. Well, I appreciate the the mercy on that one. Believe me that I've given myself plenty to cry about. So thank you for not rubbing it in. And uh, yes, no, I'm just happy to, to hop on. You know, we've been friends for a while, colleagues for uh, quite some time. And first time I'm on your show, but uh, I'm excited to be. It's a, a real pleasure. Uh, always uh, admire your work. You do a great job. One of the best thank in you. the biz. So excited to be on here and talk about this uh, Inter-Miami Seattle game. Yeah, and you've normally had me on when you've done different, uh, different. I don't want to say interviews, but different talks, right? We've had different talks uh, over the years, especially especially during the pandemic, um, where we were doing Zoom calls and just talking about the state of MLS. Um, so I figured it's time to reciprocate that and and give back, and and flip it around and have you on Miami Total <laughs> Football Radio. So let's just start. Let's dive right into it. Obviously, we are recording on a Wednesday. And on Wednesday night, the Seattle Sounders will play New York City FC in the second leg of their CONCACAF Champions League semifinal. The Sounders are up 3-1. to one. So it looks like they'll go through, but, you know, soccer's unpredictable. Anything can happen. But let's just say, for preview's sake, from a health perspective, everyone will be available for Saturday that's available as of today. And let's say that the Sounders see it through. 
that's what the you know that's what the odds are on, right? That the Seattle will see it through. Although again, anything can happen. So let's just go from that standpoint. Obviously, things can change, and and this preview might be a little bit dated by by the time it comes out. But regardless, what do you expect from the Seattle Sounders on Saturday against an Inter Miami team that's coming off of uh, their first win of the season, uh, a Leonardo Campana hat trick, three to two against the New England Revolution. Absolutely. Well, that, that there are, you know, a couple of things that can change, as you said, and we will go uh, on the side of caution here and uh, perhaps, you know, think that Seattle would get through to the next round. And I think that if that is the case, uh, you will see some rotation from Seattle Sounders uh, for that Saturday game, some obligated Raul Rodriguez uh, played 80 plus minutes last game, which I think is a lot more than uh, that Seattle wanted. Uh, but but you know the game was uh, so vibrant. Uh, it was so important for Seattle to continue attacking that I think that they left them on uh, as well as Nicolas Adero. So if they do go through the next round, I would expect both of them to uh, perhaps get rotated uh, and you might see a Freddie Montero or a Will Bruin start on that Saturday game. Uh, Nicolas Adero would of course be replaced by Albert Rusnak. And that's just what I foresee in the event that Seattle goes through. Uh, if the opposite happens then i think that they might put a a more of a starting lineup just to kind of uh leave behind if if something that drastic happens uh so i th- that's kind of the way i'm going to see it i do think that today's game tonight's game will be very big and will determine the way that uh game on saturday's plays in terms of players you are right in uh, the fact that Everybody will be available that is available today unless anything happens. Um, with the exception of Yemar Gomez Andrade, uh, finalist for MLS Defender of the Year. Last season, he is by far the best defender Seattle has. A big, big uh, absence. However, Jackson Reagan, uh, 25-year-old, six foot six center back, has done very, very well. He's one of the bright spots for this team over the 2022 season. Coming off mainly playing USL with Tacoma Defiance, has really picked up the game well, has even taken a lot of that role from Javier Arriaga to be the first one to come out playing with the ball from the uh, back end line the way Seattle likes to do so. So he's just been very good, good on the air, good on one-on-one defending. Uh, so uh, that is the only absence, but one that has been fulfilled in a good way, in a very effective way by Seattle. That's interesting because if that's the case, then Inter Miami needs to be rooting, I'm sure, for the Sounders to win tonight because they'd probably rather play a less than full strength Seattle Sounders side than a, than a full strength Seattle Sounders side. Now I'll ask you this just as to compound on that. Seattle did not play a game this past weekend in MLS. They played last they played last week in the in the CONCACAF Champions League. They've had they had the weekend off. Now they play again Wednesday. So why do you think that they would maybe not go with you know, some first choice players, even if they do win, given that they'll be at home. I know it's a short turnaround. Obviously, it's a short turnaround. But the fact, you know, it's not like they're playing three games in, in eight or nine days, like like is the case sometimes at different points in the season. I think that from the sports science uh, part of it, when it mm-hmm. comes to the travel days, when it comes to the training that they will get here after maybe a couple of days, it would be beneficial to some of those players that are coming back from muscle injuries like uh, uh, Raul Rodriguez to get some rest, especially when, you know, Freddie has done so well in CONCACAF Champions League. He has been a, a producer, you know, since he's been in Seattle. Will Bruin is another player that that has been dying to get minutes and is someone who you do want to get up to speed for what's coming up ahead for this team if they continue in CONCACAF Champions League. You're going to need that rotation. You're going to need those players in good rhythm to help alleviate some of those tight scheduling and, you know, perhaps a a huge final where you want all your players at their best. So uh, that is just my thought process, understanding the way the team plays. I think that... um, uh, Obed Vargas is a player that may not see a lot of minutes today, but perhaps against uh, Inter Miami, you want to get him back on that 
streak of games that he was so uh, important for the squad. You don't want to have that hot player get cold, you know, put him in the fridge and <laughs> allow his good, good moment to pass by. So uh, that's why I think that you might see some rotation from uh, the Sounders side just to get guys in rhythm, just to make sure that some of those guys don't get overextended minutes and they do have a little bit of rest time with the travel in general. Right, and tonight's game, the Champions League game, Wednesday night's game, is at Red Bull Arena in Harrison, New Jersey. So Seattle, like Inter Miami, will be taking a cross country flight at some point after that. So going now towards how Seattle's doing this season. If you look at them in terms of the standings right now in the Western Conference, they're in eleventh place with a two win, one draw, and two loss record. Six goals scored, six goals against. So that means a zero goal differential. Not the greatest of starts for Seattle. Do you chalk that up? And I ask you the same question I asked Frank DeLapa a week ago with regards to the New England Revolution. Do you chalk that up to them having to balance out the CONCACAF Champions League? We know historically teams that are still competing in the CONCACAF Champions League, they tend to to maybe not do so well at the start of an MLS season because, like you said, or like you hinted at, at, at as a possibility, you know, that they're, that they're rotating lineup. So is that what's been going on for Seattle in MLS play? Or has there been something else that hasn't gone that well up to this point? No, I think that those numbers and that statistic uh, and, you know, even their standings are a little bit skewed. Part of that is what you just said, the ability to balance out two tournaments and, and rotating players and things. But I do feel like Seattle this season had a very hard time getting players to their preseason. There were issues with Joe Paulo, Raul Rodriguez when he came to Visa, and, you know, other migratory problems that didn't allow him to get in with the team early. Knew who was playing with Cameroon to the point that he didn't even get with the team till the first game in Matagua. Uh, so because of that, uh, there were players that just have not— or or were not able to get fully fit. What you've seen out of Seattle in the last couple of games, including a very good and their best performance to that point against Minnesota, at Minnesota, that 2-1 win where they just dominated the, the play, where they were uh, extremely clever in the way that they move uh, their midfield and everybody was able to just get on board and they weren't able to score more goals, but they created a lot of opportunities. And then the uh, home stand here against New York City FC where once again they were effective where you saw Christian Roldan just completely dominate where you have a Jordan Morris that has a new hairstyle and looks like a whole new player because he has not looked this threatening and this defiant for a little bit right before the, the injury and uh, in this game against New York, you saw him be able to get to the end line at will. He grabbed Taven Gray and put him on as a keychain, and all he could do was hold for dear life. So when you start to see this out of this team, and you see Albert Rusnak now be able to really get used to that center defensive midfield role right next to Joe Paulo, where he can get forward, where he plays defensively, he's a very tactical, smart player, giving someone else for this Seattle team to distribute out of that back end you are now seeing what the potential of this team is truly at. I said it in Spanish in the radio call with uh, Roberto um, and, and Ariel that day. There was this cloud of injuries that has com that, that was just damning and, and was just uh, not really letting you see the true potential of this team. That's now gone, and now you're seeing what this team is capable of. So uh, with all that said, I do think those numbers are, are a little bit skewed, and what you're seeing now of this Seattle team is their true form, and it's a very good one. Now, you've touched on a lot of different players. Obviously, anyone who's followed the league closely over the last few years knows the power and the, the potency that, uh, that the Sounders have. But for people that are new or that maybe don't know or aren't that familiar with the Sounders, who are the key players to keep an eye on? Obviously, you have to start with the Peruvian, Raul Ruiz Diaz, don't you? 
<laughs> I mean, you do because I mean, he is that powder in the gun. He's what makes him extremely dangerous. But he's not the only one because just as a gun, there's a lot of components that really go through for that bullet to go through. And one of those is Joe Paulo. He is the equilibrium of this team. He is the compass. He kind of puts it all together. Uh, his leadership, his uh, IQ on the field. So you have to put him in there. You know, MVP candidate last season so he has to be in there then there's christian roldan who is this guy that that is a um a, a very small honda with a v8 block engine that can just get all over the field i mean the, the power and and the 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 field the amount of field that he covers in a day-to-day games are incredible and he has been fantastic he leads CONCACAF Champions League in assist uh he uh in this new winger role that you know he's kind of gone back and forth with he just looks so good and, and the chemistry between him and Alex Roldan has just made this team even that much better right. on tra- in transition moments so he's definitely one of those uh, players so if I had to go with three if, if that's all you allow me to say <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and say Christian Roldan Joe Paulo and Raul Ridius are, are those three key players and we're leaving some pretty big pieces yeah, out but you're that's just the way <laughs> that's just the way that this Sounder team works. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you, Nicolas Lodeiro, Jordan Morris, mm-hmm. uh, you got you have Nuhu at left back, which, by the way, I told DeAndre Yedlin we interviewed him. He's obviously returning to Seattle, his hometown, this weekend. It's obviously a, a, a subplot going into Saturday's game. Yedlin's return to Seattle. I, I mentioned to him during our interview with him that uh, I'm looking forward to that Yedlin versus Nuhu matchup. And Yedlin joked, he said, I'm not looking forward to getting bodied with it by him, but you know, he's, <laughs> he's looking forward. That's, that's going to be an interesting matchup. That's going to be an interesting matchup on that, on that flank. Uh, Nico, final question for you. What is the key to the game for Seattle? And what kind of game plan should we expect? I guess those are two questions. But what kind of game plan should we expect from Seattle? Uh, I imagine at home in front of the the amazing crowds that tend to turn out over there, I imagine that they're going to look to be the protagonist, right? And, and Inter Miami, I think, is also expecting that because reading between the lines, what Phil Neville and DeAndre Yedlin said at Tuesday on practice is that, oh, well, mostly Yedlin, is that they'll look to be compact and, and try to be good at hitting in transition. So... Game plan from Seattle, and what's the key to the game? Game plan for Seattle is going to be, just like you said, being a protagonist, being aggressive, pressuring quite high, and trying to uh, create mistakes for a inner Miami team that tends to have a hard time getting out of their own field. Uh, they have done this consistently over the last couple of games. Seattle, our, I wasn't used to seeing this Seattle team pressure as high as they have and as effectively as they have. You saw it against New York in the last game, so I I think you're going to see it again against Inter Miami. They have been able to really uh, minimize how teams uh, affect their play and they create their own tempo. Uh, so I think that's going to be important for Seattle is how they pressure, how they attack. They're going to try to dominate the ball uh, and win the numbers battle in the middle of the field. The, the 4-3-3 that at times uh, Miami plays can leave them a little bit vulnerable in the midsections, and those are bubbles and, and, and uh space between lines that Albert Rusnak, Nicolas Odero love to exploit. So I, I think that that's what Seattle is going to want to do is pressure high, dominate the ball and effectively use those spaces in between lines that at times in Miami allows and, and is a little bit vulnerable on. Um, should be, it should be a good matchup. Tactically it should be a good matchup. I'm looking forward to it because like you said, I expect Seattle to have the ball, no doubt. And they have the ability to, carving their Miami Open with the players that they have. But I, I, I'm also curious to see how Inter Miami does when they get hit in transition. When they start coming out of their shell a little bit, how Seattle... Could, because Seattle has the weapons, and it has the speed, and it has the, 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 the ability to hit that final pass in behind. And there's so many different ways that Seattle can hurt you that I'm curious to see how Inter Miami does in terms of the the defensive transitioning for themselves because if if seattle catches a mistake which in, like you said in Miami makes plenty of or has made plenty of i think seattle will punish them and i think that that could be a key to to the game nico 
Where can people find your work? Where can they follow you? Obviously on Twitter or anything you want to plug, the floor is yours to do so now. I appreciate that, man. And I don't got to send you no check yet. That's awesome. <laughs> well, you can always follow me on at El Rolo NW, E-L-R-O-L-O, NW, El Rolo NW. Uh, follow my work in Pulso Sports, PulsoSports.com, as well as Sounder of Heart, where I do a lot of my – or all of my English content. Uh, so follow me there. Our YouTube channel is filled with good interviews. We do those round tables that you've been a part of. Uh, just go ahead and look for the channel of Pulso Sports in YouTube. A lot of great content there. So I really appreciate you having me on, Franco. Uh, it is a pleasure, and I hope it's not the last time we do it. And, and I think you're right. It's going to be fun. I want to see Leonardo Campana, man. I've been huge. I've been a big follower of this guy uh, for quite some time. He's someone that I know Chris Henderson has been following and since his time in Seattle, and I'm excited to see him play against this this, this backline, man. So it'll be a fun one. I fully expect him to start. Obviously, he scored a hat trick and is a player of the week. I don't see how Phil Noble drops him, even with Gonzalo Higuain potentially being back in the mix. Though I'm hearing, I'm hearing that Gonzalo Higuain may very well miss out on this one. I've just heard that as of the last few minutes via via sources. Uh, Nico, before I let you go, and I do thank you for your time, but before I let you go, we have a new tradition here on Miami Total Football Radio, which is also called Miami Total Football Radio en Español. Hermano, you have to give us one Miami Total Football Radio en Español. You have to say it. I'm sure you're going to pass with flying colors as a Colombian because I, we have other people that, that don't speak Spanish fluently and they've tried and it hasn't <laughs> been great, but I imagine you will give us the very best version that we have to date. So the floor is yours yet again. Y estamos en Miami Total Football Radio. <laughs> wow, that, hey, that's, that's, that's probably better than mine. I'm a little worried now. Don't be moving to South Florida, bro, because we can't be having you take, take my role over here and my seat over here, okay? I need to keep my seat nice and, nice and warm, all right? Actually, I might even edit that out, actually. No, I'm just kidding. Nico, thank you so much for the time, brother. We really appreciate all your insight uh, with regards to the Seattle Sounders. Again, that game takes place on Saturday. Day night at Lumen Field. So make sure if you're an Inter Miami fan, you stay up late or you have some snacks or anything to help you keep awake. I mean, it's Saturday night. South Floridians are usually up at that time anyway. But anyway, Nico, thanks again. We will talk to you again very, very soon. Thank you, my man. That was fun. Okay, guys, before we get to the Q&A session, we have to hear El Primo's thoughts on the World Cup draw. Jose and I have already touched on that. We've dissected it. We've said our thoughts about the groups, the groups of death. But I'm curious to hear Steve's overall thoughts, but more particularly with regards to England's group, which, of course, includes the good old US of A. Yeah, that's a, that's brilliant. Even I, I'm, I'm getting calls now, even from, from newspapers. I mean, it's only, what, we April... You know, get, get as much USA stuff in the in the bag as possible because that's going to be a huge game. Day after Thanksgiving as well. Black Friday. Just speaking to DeAndre Yedlin about it yesterday briefly, and um, yeah, it was uh, that's that's going to be huge. And and people keep saying to me, even like my friends, you know, oh, the England are going to steamroll the US. I, I think it's a complete fifty fifty match. You really just don't don't know USA. No, got, man. US Come on, got Steve. Match yes, it. Steve. There we go. There we go. I've watched. Nothing in the World Cup games to know. Nothing is a given, man. <laughs> Absolutely nothing is a given. No 50 way. 50 game, no. mate. Steve. Pulisic. McKinney, I'm on board. I'm on board. Uh, you know, those guys. No. It's a 50 50 game, mate. For the first time in a long time, Primo, I think we've agreed on something. For the first time in a long time. Unlike, unlike the penalty kick. Unlike the penalty kick. But I, uh, we agree here because Jose said the U.S. is. Uh, has, you, Jose said this, this, this exact phrase. U.S. has slim chances to get out of that group. And I was like, what? No way. No way. The U.S. is second. Because they will be forced to play defense, and they and cannot play oh, defense. In CONCACAF, they never play defense. They're because forced to attack different. consistently. Oh, it's, con you're comparing CONCACAF to the World Cup level. Like, it's not the same at all. 
U.S. is a power. That's what you're doing. You, no, That's what you're no, doing no, 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 no. U.S. Yes, is a you're power. Comparing, you're, no, saying that, you're saying that the U.S. move on from the group stage just because of what you saw in CONCACAF. No, that's, that's absolutely... No, 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 no. See, I'm just letting you know... Uh, Jose, you Jose, 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 you're telling me, I, you're I telling me Jose, that the U.S. He misinterprets, he misinterprets what I say often. I said the U.S. has historically been known to be defensive. In CONCACAF, they're one of the heavyweights. They, ha- they are more inclined to play attacking soccer especially now with this new young wave of talents. But at the higher level, they're going to have to defend more. And I they absolutely see them being counterattacked. And- I don't know if that's trouble for them. I mean, again... Under- that is un- trouble for them. Let me remind you, the U.S. qualified to the World Cup on goal differential. Oh, goal absolutely. differential. And I, and I said last week, I said, Greg Berhalter, there are questions about the job he can do. So with regards to how he can manage it, that, that's a fair question, and that's a fair concern to have going into the World Cup. Thank you. But historically speaking, the U.S. the U.S. has been strong in defending, in counterattacking, and in good goalkeeping, and that's how they've had historically their biggest successes on the biggest stages. That's just that's and yes, England England is going to have a lot of trouble with the counterattack game. Like they don't see that every every day. Come on, <laughs> no, hold on, no, no. just one second. Are yeah. you telling me that? The U.S. won't be able to get out of group. Okay, England's it, it, they could lose to England. They're not going to beat Iran, uh, and then one of Wales, Scotland, and Ukraine. I mean, you know, the come only on. ch- they, I, I'll give him more more of a chance if Scotland comes into the group. Oh, or Wales, but, man, that's the same. Wales it's the same and Ukraine, the same. I think they're going to have trouble. No, no way, no saying. way. The, the the U.S. will look at that and think it'll be an app, and it will absolutely, be absolutely, absolutely. If they, if they do not get out of that group, I'm, they'll look yeah. and think, oh no. We're gonna to have to play Wales. I mean, I'm surprised by you know yeah, I'm why? surprised by this by this one from Jose. But I did. Hey, listen, for those of you listeners out there that I don't know, maybe some of you agree with Jose. I don't know, but if most of you have the response of Steve and I, well, then this is why at one point I mentioned on the podcast that Jose's wife and I call him Island Jose because sometimes, sometimes his his opinions, <laughs> as as is the case for all of us, right? We all have these types of opinions in some facet or in some way, shape, or form with regard to some topic. Jose's opinions at times can be very, very, very out there. And just, I listen, I don't agree with that at all. I agree with Steve. The U.S. likes that, would love that draw. You know, they could have been a much tougher draw for them. They'll take that draw. That's a, that's a favorable draw, I think, is how I phrased it last week. They, yeah. should, they should be in the top two. They should be in the top two. Probably 100%. number two. Odds on, odds on to be the number two. But I, again, like I tweeted out when the draw happened... I could see them taking this group if they play up to their potential and if they they find a way to get a result against England or can beat England. Because, Steve, I don't know if you agree with this, but but the U.S., I think if they would have landed in a group with Argentina, Brazil, those teams, oh. they, those teams they, can't, they can't really... They, I don't think they can beat, you know, more often than mm. not. I don't think they can beat. Just the technical qualities of the other team tends to expose the U.S. But in the, against a team like England, which does have some technical qualities with this new batch of players that they have, the, this new, this generation, I think the matchup suits the U.S. better because England also is a physical team. Like, the U.S. is a physical team. So, look, we've seen a U.S. team at a World Cup 2010 that was not favored on paper to to get a result against England, and they and they did. And they did. So. Third place in CONCACAF is not a favorite in any group in any World Cup. No. It's not anyway. a favorite. Not number two. Number two. Okay, Steve. Just finally, it's all about the first game. Leonardo Campagna against Qatar. So there you go. <laughs> 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 hey, hey, maybe. Maybe. It could, ha- it. It could happen. It could happen. It could happen. Yes, it could. Absolutely. Patrick. If, if he, no, it will, he, has to, you know, he has to get called up and uh, we'll see if that happens. We'll see if that happens. But I know... Ecuador's, you know, the Ecuador fans are clamoring for a more proven or a more uh, consistent number nine. If Campana gets on a roll this year, maybe he he will be the the player they. He'll be to. in the squad, won't he? He'll be he'll be in the squad do if you, he's fit, as long as he's fit. Do you have any favorites for the World Cup? Um, no, not really, not right now. Um, Argentina with Messi, they you know they've they've been on a roll, but I don't know if I if I, I can if I give it to them. I don't know if I I think they're the favorite, but I, I'm just asking. I'm just asking if you had any. Anyway. I don't know. For I mean, you know, you can't look. The normal sort of uh, culprits, France, really. They've just got a lot, you know, good young players as well coming through. Germany are in a bit of bit of flux right now. Could be a dark horse. Diego Alonso. Diego Alonso of Uruguay. Yeah, starting off Ghana with Ghana. 
Um, Ima- Ima- imagine what would happen if, if if that happened. You know, imagine what happened. Ghana, Portugal, and Korea Republic. I mean, if Uruguay don't get, I mean, that's that's amazing, really, the thing that he, you know, he's gone from into Miami. Now he's gone to the World Cup. Would really be, I mean, it'd be a failure. For, I mean, it's actually a hard group. Portugal, Ghana, I, That's the Uruguay, group I said. Korea. That's the group I said is the group of death. That's, and there's there's that's not really nasty. there's yeah. <laughs> that's nasty. There's not really a group of death in in this World Cup. I mean, I, just, I feel like they're all pretty much. They're, they're all fairly balanced. They're all fairly balanced. So that, that was a question I had for Jose, and we'll finish that with that for you, Steve. If you had to pick one group out of those eight to say that is the group of death for me, Steve Brenner, which one would it be? Well, I mean, Group E, we don't know who the who they're going to get in the in the playoff. Is that is that Peru, Australia? Is that is that that is that that group? I don't I don't have it in front of me, but Group E is Germany, Spain. It's Spain. No, so that's Spain, Costa Rica Germany. or New Ze- or New Zealand. Because Peru would fall into Group D, I believe. And again, I'm going off the top of my head, right, so if France, I'm wrong, yeah. Peru, Denmark, I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. That group H, Diego Alonso's group's not great, and I think even Brazil, Serbia, Switzerland, Cameroon. I mean, I don't know. Oh, I mean Argentina, Argentina's group also Argentina, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, and Poland. I mean, I mean know, Saudi, Saudi Poland, Arabia's not going in. Saudi Arabia's not going. Not going. No, in. so. But Mexico and Poland could cause Argentina problems. But anyway, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We're looking forward to the World Cup, clearly, as you can tell on, on Miami see. Total Football Radio. We will touch on the, the World Cup, as I mentioned last week, and I will reiterate this week. We will touch on the World Cup throughout this year and obviously ramp up our conversations about it as it gets closer. Still some groups or yeah, some groups to be finalized, some teams to be determined, including hopefully, I'm hoping that Peru makes it through. And if they do... Steve, they'd be in a group that's very similar to what they played last time. Because last time they had France, they had Denmark, and they had Australia. So it would be almost exactly the same. And they might have to play Australia in the playoff, depending on Australia's result versus the United Arab Emirates. Anyway, Q&A time. Q&A time. Let's get to it. Let's try to knock out a few of these. I will ask one of you to answer. If the other one has anything they want to add, feel free. But otherwise, you know, this, this will drag on. So let's just start with... Steve, Roberto Rio de Neira asks, do you think there's going to be a direct impact for Inter Miami with the probable purchase of Real Zaragoza? Is this going to be good or bad for the Herons? Excellent question. Um, I don't know is, is the honest answer. I think a lot of teams now want to try and follow this Man City model of, of owning you know, multiple clubs. City owned teams in Spain, in Japan, in Uruguay, um, um in, in, in the US, obviously, England, Australia. Um, so I think that's the kind of, you know, the way forward to establish these solid networks with teams in, in other in other leagues and other countries. Um, so I think it would probably affect them positively, if if if, if anything. But, you know, um, we'll have to just... I, I don't know the ins and outs of the deal right now as we sit here. So, um, um, you know, but I think it's, it's an interesting move. It just shows that's the way most clubs and franchise and organization thinking now they want to spread their wings as far as possible. And I think it only benefit, you know, the teams in terms of players and scouting in networks and, uh, you know, coaches and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how it all develops. And, and just to clarify, because Roberto's question says with the probable purchase, the move has happened. It was announced last Friday, if I'm not mistaken, that Jorge and Jose Mas are part of the investment group, excuse me, investment group, that has acquired 51% of the second division club, Spanish club. So they are part of an ownership group that now owns more than half, or slightly more than half, of 50% of Real Zaragoza. So that, that move has happened. Jose, I said I was going to go between both of you, but is there anything you want to add there? Because I think this is one you would definitely like to touch on. Um. Well, you know... the. The one thing that we're going to have for sure is a friendly match at some point, right? Uh, I don't know if that's going to happen every every year, but I'm sure Zaragoza will come over to the states during the off season and and play a friendly match. So I think that's that should be a given. I don't know if the calendar is good enough for Inter Miami to go to Spain to play. So most likely that game will will take place here. That's something that should happen. It has happened before in a similar situation. And the one thing that I wish, you know, is that maybe, you know, Inter Miami gets a little bit of help as well from Zaragoza. You would expect uh, um, that they know how to run the club. It's a historic club in, in Spain. So, you know, it, it wouldn't be that bad to get a little bit of help, not sign five DPs, just three, follow the rules. That'd be good. <laughs> I, th- I do think we're going to see trials 
or maybe even loans in between. We could see that later on. Not not immediately, but I think we could see that later on. Trials for young players that, you know, give them a little more seasoning uh, abroad and at a different level and a different type of, of football. And I also think, you know, at some point you could see some loans where, you know, maybe some young Spanish players or young players in, in the pipeline over there are loaned to Miami to get some minutes that maybe they wouldn't get at, at Saragossa. Because obviously I, I imagine that the goal is to get Saragossa back into into the first division, into the top tier. So we'll, we'll see how, how, those, how that all plays out. Next question comes from Don Cafecito. I will go to you, Jose. Open Cup is important according to Phil. How will he rotate the squad given the short recovery time between the Seattle match and Miami FC match? Also, I'd like to believe the club took my limpieza de huevo advice. For once, luck was on our side in Campana's third goal. And he puts the emoji of a, a little face and then uh, uh, an egg for the huevo, of course. Jose, what do you want to uh, what do you want to say about that? Um, well, I think Phil gave us an indication um, this week uh, about, you know, some of the Inter-Miami 2 players having the opportunity to be on the roster for, for the game on Tuesday against Miami FC. Um, I think, you know, it all depends on what happens over the weekend, but I, I, I am still not, uh, I, I don't, I don't buy the idea that, you know, they are going to play, uh, the regular MLS starters in open cup. I, I don't see that happening. I don't see that happening. I think they need those players for Seattle. If, if they don't want to have, uh, you know, if they don't want to get into back into that five nail situation that we saw last year so um no i i think i, I think you know I, obviously they want to win the game and and they're going to try to put as, as many starters as possible but i think in the end it's 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 not going to be a full squad of mls regular starters that will play against the miami fc Okay, next question comes from Luis Mega. This one's directed at me, so I will take it. He says, Franco, it was nice to meet you Saturday. Do you think Phil is taking too long to make subs? After the first half, Inter Miami had the game in control, but we allowed the Revs to get control and momentum of the game, and they tied. South Florida weather is a factor, and we need to use it. We had young players like Duke, Allen, and Rodriguez come in to play seven minutes. There's a lot of exclamation points and question marks with regards to that statement with you know them playing only seven minutes. And he finishes off, Luis Mega finishes off by saying, we need to be grinding down opponents. I do think that Phil's taking a bit too long, just my personal opinion, uh, with his substitutions over the last two games. I think he's taking a little bit long. But in this game, like I said before, they panned out. The timing and the players that were introduced, they panned out. But again, I also agree with the analysis that in the second half, Inter-Miami wasn't playing great up until, up until that moment. So I think, you know, I think going forward... Going to the bench sooner is something, you know, Phil Neville will probably look to do because I don't know if, uh, if, if they'll be able to get results or continuously get results, you know, if, you know, with games in the balance, if, if they take this long to, to go to the bench. So next question comes from Anthony Armelado. And he says, what do you guys think about Robert Taylor's year so far? P.S. Respect for pronouncing my last name correctly on the first try last week. Also, I've seen a lot of rumors of Fenerbahce terminating Mesut Ozil's contract. How would you feel if Inter Miami were to try to sign him? Jose, I'll, I will I will ask you about Robert Taylor, and then Steve, you can tackle Ozil if you want. Jose, you first. Um, I don't like what I've seen from Robert Taylor so far. Um, I, I, obviously, there's talent there. He's a talented player, but collectively, I want to see more from him. I want to see a lot more from him, and I think that's that. That'll be that'll be better for for the team. Um, individually, I just, to me right now, it's, it's just a lot of one B one and, and I want to see him moving without the ball, connecting with his teammates and just contribute a little bit more. He was brilliant on Saturday. What are you talking about? No, no. Did you watch, did you see it? Yeah, it was what you <laughs> Yes. No. Did Not you see it? Taylor. Sorry, Primo. I'm, gonna, enough. I'm going to I'm going to I'm game. going to use that. I'm going to use that every time I disagree with either you, Jose, or Steve. I'm just gonna be like, did you see it? Did you not watch the game? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a valid, it's a valid question. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I, I you know we get we'll, we'll go into it a little bit here because I think there's there's a little more discussion to be had. 
I like Robert Taylor's aggressiveness with the ball and, and his verticality. He looks to make things happen, whether it's taking shots, whether it's trying to go at players on the dribble. But I do think he fades in and out of games a bit too much. And maybe it's down to his late arrival. He's still learning the team. Maybe still... By now, he should probably be at 100% fitness. So, you know, maybe there's still more to come from him. I imagine there is. But I like the early signs of what we've seen from Robert Taylor. I'm not saying he's the next coming of whatever. Not the next Luka Modric or anything of the like. But I, I like I like what I've seen from, from Robert Taylor by and large, while also acknowledging that there are things to, to improve on. Steve? I've already had my say on Robert Taylor. I mean, Meza Ozil, I mean, I can't see that happen. I don't think they would go down that road. Um, you know, yeah. at the end of his career, very difficult as well to, to deal with from, from, all, from all accounts. Obviously, very acrimonious departure from Arsenal. No, not very difficult to deal with, but I just think he brings, you know, that Higuain style of... Um, ego with him and I don't I couldn't see them go down there. a great player in his day I uh, saw him play for Germany in the 21s way back in the day when they beat England in the uh, European Championship playoff in UB Championship on the 21 final 2009 I think um, quality player but no I think that they 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 need to focus on good young players I think coming through someone like Jose's mate Campania um, you know that, that, that kind of thing but be a good story it's Campana Campana. There's no there's no Campana. accent over the Campana. end. Campana, Campana. Campana, which which also translates to bell. Hence my, my introduction to this week's show. Just so you know, Steve, I don't know if, if you know what Campana means or not. Um maybe you do. I'm just I'm just helping you. Yeah. I it, do it, now. I it do means now. bell. It means bell. So that's why if you see tweets with bells next to Campana's name, that that's why. That's why. I mean I've definitely done that uh, a few times. But anyway, uh that does it for the Q and A session. Let's leave it let's leave it there for now. Before we get to the final thoughts, I want to share that we are planning to have another episode recorded on Sunday, hopefully dropped on Sunday. If not dropped on Sunday, first thing Monday morning, obviously recapping the Sounders game, but previewing Tuesday night's game, the Open Cup match against Miami FC, which obviously Jose is really looking forward to, though he might not be in attendance. Come on, Jose. Come on, Jose. Uh, but yes, we are planning to do a special special podcast on very short turnaround, and we plan to have or we're trying to get multiple guests on it from both teams as well as uh, another guest. I won't say who it is, but another guest. So let's let's you know keep keep your eyes out for that. Obviously, it will happen during the weekend if it does. So uh, you know maybe you guys are busy, but we definitely plan to have a show very early next week ahead of the Tuesday night game. But Gentlemen, final thoughts. Start with you, Steve, since you are back on the show. Although I don't think you'll be on on Sunday, right? You're 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 going a wall again. Uh, Sunday, Sunday. Yeah, I've got a couple of things on on on, on Sunday, unfortunately. But uh, no, good to be back in the swing. But we, you know, we, it was good at, also to have. I we do like I do like doing other sports and the tennis. You know, it was great. Um, you know, good media operation there. We got to speak to a load of players. It was uh, there was good good stories. Uh, me and Jose saw some some good matches. Um, so that was fun. Yeah, I do like dipping in. I do like dipping in Thomas sports. And if, if anyone ever wants to go and watch cricket in Barbados, I can thoroughly recommend it because uh, just got there at ten o'clock, start drinking some local banks beer, and just enjoy the day. So there you go. And then come back into it. And now we're uh, we're in the middle of the of the season. There's plenty happening, so which is all good. Jose, you're up. Uh, well, I wish I could fast forward to the Miami Classico. I've been waiting for that matchup for a while, so I'm very excited. I uh, was watching closely the draw, and um, yeah, I was very happy about it. I think that's great for the city. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun that the game as, as well as in FIU. And, um, you know, Inter-Miami fans, well, some of them will go back because obviously... Miami FC was here before, but some of the new Inter Miami fans will get to experience um, soccer in Miami, so that'd be great. And um, yeah, I'm just looking forward to that. I think you know uh, we got some really good quotes as well yesterday from from Phil talking about um, Anthony Pulis and you know the relationship they had. So you know, yeah, there's a rivalry, but there you know there's there's always something that you know, positive that, that's going to come out of this. Obviously, the Jamaicans as well. Damian Lowe will be, will be playing against Lamar Walker and Speedy Williams. 
So that should be a lot of fun. Hopefully fans are able to go to the game and, and enjoy it. Obviously, this is a preview of the preview that we'll be doing. <laughs> I was I, mean, I was not going to interrupt you. I was going to let you finish, but I was going to say, Jose, you love just jumping ahead. <laughs> the second yes. time I said we're going to do a preview pod, and <laughs> Jose is going doing a whole preview episode just on his own in his final I'm just, his I'm final just very excited about this game. Very happy that it is happening. I think it's really, really good for the city. So... And tickets are just 10 bucks, which is just awesome. I really commend Miami FC for doing that because, you know, they could very easily up the prices a little bit. But, you know, no with, way, with no the... way. Nobody would go. Nobody would go if they up the price. Well, well they could have. They could it's have. It's Kendall. That. It's Kendall on a Tuesday, on a Tuesday night. It's Kendall on a Tuesday night. Well, ten dollars, I think it's great, great price. You know, even for people that have, haven't been able to go for a lot of them watch Inter Miami because it's a long drive parking the ticket prices are too high well this is your chance to watch inter miami maybe for the first time so it, it's gonna be great it's gonna be great okay well maybe now we don't need that episode on sunday because jose just you know touched on oh everything. i have a lot more to say don't worry about that. i have a lot more to say don't worry okay well we will do a proper preview and as get, well as have some guests like i mentioned before on sunday hopefully so stay tuned for that my final thought and i won't get sad here but thank you to all the listeners of Miami Total Football Radio that came up to me on Saturday before and after the game and, and shared some time with me, expressed their condolences, and uh, and and just we got to talk about life, about about the team, and it, it was it was nice. It was nice to to be with Vice City in the pregame. It was nice to be with Southern Legion in in the postgame. They had a very good barbecue, which I, I thoroughly enjoyed. So thank you to those two supporters groups as well as thank you to just every individual that that reached out to me i i just was walking around the stadium at at certain points as well and um different different people pulled me over to either say hi um or to 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 share their thoughts so thank you guys very very much we will leave it there for this week's show wait 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 wait. why are we not why are primo and jose not invited to those barbecues after the game excuse me excuse me you guys are everybody's invited to any no, of no. these, no, no. Listen, I, I have I, not received any invitation. Maybe they told you, and you no, haven't. Really no, 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 no. See, I don't get a direct invite. Like they don't personally roll out a red carpet for Franco Panizo. That's not how this works. Yeah, they probably they, do. They, they have plans for themselves as supporters groups before and after games. Usually, definitely before, occasionally after, and I and I pop in and I pop in and I've I've said for a while now that. All of us should go go over there, but you know I know you guys are very busy men who are both married, unlike myself, who is a single single guy. So I have more free time on my hands than you guys do. So I understand you guys being busy, but the invitation is there, and I I am sure the the listeners and the Inter Miami fans would love to have you guys as well and hear from you in person, sure, so, so they can up. debate and argue and. You know all the all that good stuff in person. You know instead of listening to us do it amongst ourselves, you could do it with them in person, or they could do it with you in person. But you know they can tell you guys how wrong you are about the penalty kicks. But you guys have to show up for that. And, <laughs> you know it's a, it's a, it's up to you. It's up to you guys. But I I imagine the invitations there. I imagine the invitations there. All right. All right. All right. All right. Well, I'll and that there. does that does it for this week's show. Thank you guys again so much for listening. We'll be back very very soon. Very very shortly previewing that next game against Miami FC and recapping this weekend's match against the Seattle Sounders. So for Jose Armando, for Steve Brenner, I am Franco Penizo. This is Miami Total Football Radio. And we'll talk to you guys again. Peace.